It's on. <clears throat> Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, my name is Demi Ajayi, and I'm the Open Source Community Manager at Call for Code for Racial Justice at IBM. And today, I'll be talking about the power of cohorts in advancing open source contribution. Um, and just a little bit more about myself. I've been in my current role for about a little bit over a year, so learning a lot about um, open source contribution and just community management in general. So I'll be sharing a little bit of some of my lessons learned uh, through something we've done in Call for Code specifically. And just an agenda for today. Um, so we'll be talking about what Call for Code is, as you might not be familiar with that, some of us in this room. Um, also what the impacts of Call for Code has been and, and our model. And also just talking generally about the benefits and challenges of contribution and what our approach to cohorts has been as well as best practices. So a little bit more about Call for Code. So Call for Code is a multi-year program that is created by the David Clark Cause uh, with IBM as a founding technical partner. Um, and we have also worked with the United Nations Human Rights and the Linux Foundation to create a platform where people can contribute to Tech for Good projects. And we feature one of the, the largest uh, Tech for Good competition of its kind um, all around the world here. And Call for Code inspires developers to create applications for the real world that have real impact on humanitarian issues um, that are relevant and pressing in the world. And what we do after we've created these projects is to make them open source projects for other people to utilize. And we've worked with over 400,000 innovators um, who've participated in Call for Code since we started in 2018. And we have a wide reach all around the world uh, with over 179 nations participating and contributing to Call for Code as well. And a little bit more about Call for Code through the years. So we are in our fifth year, so it's a landmark year for us. Um, so since 2018, we've been working on addressing uh, these humanitarian issues through our various global challenges. Um, so through in 2018, we worked, uh, and, and our, the winning solution for Call for Code was Project OWL, uh, which allows first responders and victims to stay in touch in natural disasters. In 2019, the winning solution there was a solution that protects firefighters from toxic um, exposure during wildfires, essentially, by providing them with predictive analytics and just being able to monitor their exposure. We've also worked with farmers, with Agrily, and also another project, uh, Liquid Prep, uh, dealing with the effects of climate change, allowing them to better manage their resources and be able to uh, work better as they are uh, planting and harvesting their crops as well. 2020 was a landmark year for us. Um, lots of things, as you all know, were happening in the world in that time. Uh, so COVID-19, we had a special challenge uh, related to creating issue or creating solutions that would address um, the issues created by COVID-19. We also launched a Call for Code for Racial Justice, which is where I work specifically within Call for Code in reaction to uh, the events that were happening in the US and around the world related to uh, highlighting systemic racism. And uh, in 2021, we've continued our work there with climate change. And now in 2022, our global challenge theme is uh, sustainability, which we'll hear a little bit more about from my colleague. And just a little bit more about Call for Code. Um, this is our deployment framework. Essentially, primarily we've worked with having a challenge, whether that's a spot challenge or a global challenge, where it's kind of a call for um, ideas and call for solutions around a specific topic area. And then after that, we move to the deployment phase um, once a, a winner is chosen, where um, we work to build a solution to fortify and then to test the solution in the real world and working with real partners to actually see this solution implemented um, in the relevant communities there. And then we want to create sustainable solutions, so we try to find a pathway to sustainability um, where there can be real market adoption for these solutions as a way to ensure that they're continuing to live on. And just a little bit more about Call for Code as far as our model, because it's slightly a little unusual for open source projects. So what we have generally, and I'll talk about this in more detail later, is a full-time, either a full-time team or volunteer maintainers that work on these projects. We also have dedicated Call for Code support who are primarily part-time across our various projects. And of course, open source contributors. 
Um, and these, of course, some of the people who worked on our various projects from our 2022 win winner, Southwater, um, to some of our earlier solutions as well. And just a little bit about our impact with Call for Code. Um, this is a snapshot of what we've been able to accomplish with our various projects. So um, we've been able to deploy our solutions. That's what these dots refer to, is where we've actually been able to deploy these solutions in communities around the world. And more specifically, um, for one of our projects, we've had over 1,000 app downloads for that. And just generally, we've had over 250 sensors deployed across our projects. Um, around the world as well. So definitely it's been encouraging to see, you know, these ideas go from initial, just an idea where a group of people are coming together to actual solutions that are now being implemented and affecting the lives of people around the world. Um, and just a little bit more, and that's kind of, you know, one of the benefits of open source contribution is really being able to contribute to something that has effects and impact on people. Um, and, you know, some of the other benefits of open source contribution are, um, are being able to improve skills. You know, this is why people get involved in open source, being able to see the benefits of working on open source projects, um, building reputation, solving a problem in the world, which we've seen definitely. And definitely, overall, it's definitely not about the money, right? It's more about the thrill of contribution that people, uh, causes people to participate in these open source projects. But there are definitely some challenges uh, with open source, as I'm sure some of you well know, um, specifically for both the contributors and for the maintainers. Um, some of the challenges within open source, this is a, a survey that was done over 17,000 developers surveyed by the developer nation. Um, and you know, some of the things that maintainers have said as far as that make open source challenging essentially boil down to a lack of support, uh, which I have distilled a little bit further to either funding or people power. Um, so a lack of funding has been a problem, right? So I guess in theory, people could potentially work on these projects full time. And if they're able to work on them full time, then they wouldn't be as overwhelmed with all the work that they'd have to do there. Um, another problem that people have had is just a lack of other people to share the burden with of maintainership. So definitely that can be something to be addressed as far as support. And just a bit more about the details of um, the challenges here. We're seeing you know, people not being financially compensated. It can be stressful. They can feel underappreciated for the work they're doing. Users can be very demanding and expect too much of them. Again, that might be something that could, could be alleviated by having more people if handled right. Um, it can be lonely, definitely that could be a thing if you're the only maintainer or one of few maintainers working on a project. Um, it, it's, it's hard to maybe have momentum or keep going, especially, you know, there's no one to vent to. It's just you dealing with all these users um, or maybe you want you and a few other people working with that. Um, definitely could be a major challenge as far as open source maintenance. So um, what we're going to talk about today is how we can use people power to address these problems, right, so that we can continue to create these sustainable, long-lasting solutions that have real impact in the world. And just a little bit more statistics about open source projects here. Um, Fortunately, the bottom of my one of my citations is cutting off. Apologies there. Um, so, 66, 60 percent of open source projects have only one or two maintainers, um, and this is in study a study that was done in 2015 and cited again in 2019 about this. So, many projects are kind of like the Pareto principle on steroids, right? Where we have just very few people contributing to these projects and maintaining them. And then even more about contributions, we see that there are 50% of um, contributors to popular OS projects account for only 2% of commits, which is kind of wild, right? So um, definitely we're seeing a lot of people doing the lion's share of the work, both in maintaining the projects as well as contributing to these projects. So now with this in mind and you know, thinking a bit about maintainership and the stresses thereof, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about Call for Code's approach to um, s dealing with some of these problems and what we've tried. So just a little bit more about Call for Code. Again, just a little bit more detail with the slide that I shared earlier as far as the model here. Um, we have, as far as our full-time maintainers, um, the projects that have full-time maintainers, I'd say about 30% of our projects do have some full-time maintainers. 
Um, and the products that don't have full-time maintainers, 70% um, of them are, are such. And as I mentioned before, um, we've had, we have dedicated support for Call for Code. So in addition to the people who are working either part-time or full-time on, on the projects, you know, the people who won, who won the challenge, we also have our Call for Code staff who also work to support the projects. But we are kind of doing that on a part-time basis because we are either uh, supporting multiple projects individually or we're doing uh, the, you know, the, the maintainership role in addition to other responsibilities within Call for Code. And some more stats, we have about 80% of our projects have two or more volunteer maintainers. Um, from what I was able to gather from just surveying our team was about maybe two to five maintainers mostly. Um, and the asterisk is because this is assuming we take our call for code for racial justice projects in aggregate and treat them as basically one project. Specifically for the call for code for racial justice projects, currently today I'd say most of our projects have one or two active maintainers and all of these people are volunteer and part-time maintainers as well. And just another you know, key point about our Call for Code projects, these are tech for good projects that have real potential impact in the world where people can see how their contributions are making impact, right? So definitely there's something that causes, that makes people want to participate there. The mission resonates strongly, whether that's in climate change, um, you know, working against natural disasters, COVID-19, or racial justice. These are things that people care about. Uh, it's something that they feel impacts them personally and they do want to contribute in some way. And again, like with many other open source projects, the majority of pull requests are made by just a few maintainers, regardless of the size of the contributor, co contributor population in our cases, um, which might range from just like a few a year to maybe 10, 20, 50 uh, people a year, um, either making one-time contributions, small contributions, or maybe larger contributions as well. And so again, some of the challenges that we face with Call for Code, and I specifically will talk about Call for Code for Racial Justice, because that's the um, subset of projects that has a smaller maintainer community. Uh, the challenges that we faced with Call for Code, even though we do have you know, staff that work on these projects, is that we still do have a small contributor community and even though we still do have people who are being paid to work on these projects and par partly through Call for Code and IBM, um, we still do have the same problems that other open source projects have. And the other problem is that we need deep engagement to advance these projects, right? So if someone comes on board, they're very excited to participate in a project. There's still like an onboarding period, of course, with all open source projects that they need to be able to actually start being an active, productive participant in the project. And then the other issue that many open source projects face, of course, is that we have transient contributors, right? Like people come in, they're excited, maybe they, you know, they're lurking for a while, they might contribute, but then they drop off because they get busy with school if they're students, other things come up, projects, things happen all the time, right? So these, there are some challenges to finding and retaining contributors as part of an open source project, especially when you have um, few maintainers on the projects. So moving to what we've started to do or what we've experimented with within uh, Call for Code, we have been using cohorts, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that to, to, see, uh, to, to explain a little bit what that means in the in context of Call for Code. So um, an open source cohort, um, as I'm defining it here, and I'm glad that's big on your screen, um, is that it's a group of developers and non-developers who work together on our project for, a, the time um, can, be, can vary, but what we've seen is between four and 12 weeks. There's a coordinated scope of work, so they're not just coming in and picking random issues. We try to find issues that they should work on. And we've worked with people, with groups that are either aligned enterprises, nonprofits, as well as individuals working together, or I should also have academics here as well, working together on these projects. So our past engagements have included enterprise um, cohorts where it's uh, a client of IBM, for instance, with a group of people who are interested in working on our projects. We've also worked with um, universities, and I would also would call them a cohort of, of sorts, though we weren't formally looking at them that way. Where we have people who are part of a course taking, um, who are planning to contribute to our projects as part of a, a, as part of a semester um, and looking to get involved that way. And also, I'd say we have event-based cohorts, right, because we do 
try to organize them. So for instance, we worked with, during Hacktoberfest, which as you may know, is an op a month for celebrating open source contribution. Uh, call for Code and Call for Code for Racial Justice participated in that. And we try to organize events, onboarding, et cetera, to get people to uh, contribute to our projects in that time period as well. And just a little bit on the benefits of Call for Code, you know, or these kind of this cohort model is bringing lots of people together to work together to create a platform for great applications. So a bit more about the benefits of cohorts. Um, you know, specifically for Call for Code, we've seen that it teaches people, allows people to work together on projects while meet, meeting like-minded people. So we worked with Morgan Stanley on a cohort earlier this year, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about how that went as well. And some benefits to, um, to a cohort model for an enterprise are definitely skills building, employee networking, and employee engagement. So this is something, if you're thinking of doing a cohort, that you can pitch to um, enterprise clients if you have direct access to them, just talking about the potential for upskilling, the potential for employee networking, because as we've seen, uh, people are able to work across their organization, meeting people in different capacities, uh, different skill sets, different parts of the organization, different time zones, you know, and really get to expand their network that way. And they found it to be very valuable because now they're not working in these silos, right? And they're able to interact with people on a very collaborative um, project together as well. And definitely it drives employee engagement, especially because again, when people come together to work on a joint goal, there is definitely a sense of purpose there. Um, especially with Call for Code, where, as I mentioned before, we're driving more to humanitarian projects uh, which have a real impact in the world. So people feel um, empowered to work on things like that, as well as they feel a lot of um, a lot of goodwill towards their organization to actually create this opportunity and platform for uh, from for them as employees to work together on something like this. So it's definitely a good way to engender goodwill uh, within the uh, within the company from employees. Um, I can't you know, make any claims about employee retention uh, as a result of this, but definitely it's something that makes people look favorably upon the organization. And also just speaking personally for myself, um, Call for Code for Racial Justice started as a spot challenge within Call for Code. And it was a, a few months worth of um, engagement internally. So in a way it was a cohort of itself, right? We had to come together, we worked for a while, and just seeing that our organization, IBM, really took something like this seriously, was able to invest the time in the program, programming to put together this platform for us to try to come together or to create solutions was something that made me see IBM in a new light. I got to learn about um, people around the organization, meet lots of different people. I was new at IBM at that time, so it was a great opportunity for me to meet lots of people within IBM. And it's definitely something that made me proud to be an IBMer. I feel like during the course of that uh, cohort, I heard people saying, I've never been so proud to be an IBM or just kept hearing that. I feel like I've heard it mo much more there than I've had in other encounters um, across the organization. So it's definitely something that also builds uh, company pride, right? Like knowing that your company cares about issues that are aligned uh, to you personally as well. And then a bit about the benefits of the open source community. As we've been talking about the poor maintainers who are you know, doing all this work, overworked, underpaid, um, being able to have a cohort allows them to get contributions from new members. Also, we found it creates fresh perspectives for, um, to the project, right? Because you've been working on something for so long, it's easy just to not you know, be able to see things from a different perspective. So it's good to have people who can bring fresh ideas to the project and also uh, in tandem also create, improve the open source experience, right? So um, they might notice things that you've overlooked in, in terms of the documentation, coding, et cetera. You know, maybe there are you know, new technologies that you should be considering. So it's just good to be able to have a diversity of, of, of thought around these projects that comes from having a cohort. So a little bit about our approach, um, what we've done in our cohorts, and I'll focus specifically on the enterprise projects, is that we've had, um, uh, you know, an organizing team, which is our team, the Call for Code team, in addition to an enterprise team, right? And if you're working with a nonprofit, this could also be similar. So I think it's very good to identify who on your team can do the work, as well as if there's someone or some people on another external, on the team that you're working with, that can also do the work. 
Um, in our team, that was myself and someone else, a technical lead on our team that worked together on formulating the cohort, getting things up and running, managing the cohort, and doing work uh, around that. And then on the enterprise team, you need people who can communicate internally with um, employees there, you know, provide their perspective, organize events, um, as far as we'll see the kind of events that are needed to kick off a cohort as well. So I think this is definitely something that's important to identify before starting um, working on a cohort. And then a little bit about the pre-work, there is just as a disclaimer, there's definitely a lot of work that goes into this and we'll talk about the trade-offs and the benefits and determining whether or not this is something that's useful for you. Um, the pre-work that we've done, and again, you might find that this is not, you don't need to do all of these things depending on the state of your projects, the state, uh, your team makeup and the type of projects that you're trying and maybe even the audience. You might not need to do all of these things, but these were the kind of things that we did. So we had info sessions and registration to drum up recruitment for um, the cohort ahead of time. So we launched in January, for instance, for one of our cohorts. And we're doing things, I think, in November and December to have like, you know, introductions to call for code, introduction to the kind of projects that they would be working on as part of this cohort. And um, also, you know, providing them ways to register to join the cohort and what all that it would entail, which would provide lots of information to them about that. And of course, with all open source projects at all times, we're also always trying to improve our documentation um, to make sure that it's ready in a way for more external contributors, right? Because um, if you've been managing a project for a very long time and there are not many contributors, it might be easy to overlook certain things. So we definitely spent some time to give all of our repositories a good once over to see like what was missing, what's broken, what needs to be updated to ensure that things are up to date. And of course, we're not gonna find everything because that's kind of what we need fresh eyes for, but at least making sure things make sense with something else to do. And also ensuring that our issues made sense in terms of you know, how we're documenting the work to be done. It's very easy, again, if you're working just internally to maybe use you know, um, just like short, short codes essentially or just things that are more uh, shorthands essentially that maybe are more internal to your team and might make it harder for other people to contribute. So ensuring that these issues are up to the standard of external contributors being able to pick things up and go from there. The other work that we did was also understanding the incoming skill sets, right? So we're, since we had, we knew that we're working with a cohort, it's not just like a random group of people finding us on GitHub and working on the project. We try to understand the skill sets of the people coming in. So we did um, a survey to identify what skills that they had, both technical and non-technical, because we also wanted to have non-technical people be able to contribute to these projects. And then based on that, and like based on the languages that they knew, you know, the other non-technical skills they had as far as project management or design thinking, we're then able to think about how we might want to organize teams. And then the other thing that we did was to find the key issues to work on or maybe the key repositories. So understanding what our needs were as far as roadmap, understanding the level of difficulty it would take for someone to be able to on board to that project, knowing what the skill sets were. Uh, we started to organize a list of issues from um, our backlog that we wanted uh, the cohorts to work on. And then we created some onboarding materials. So in our case, as we'll see shortly, we created handbooks um, and project deep dive videos and then project team assignments. And these were primarily to just ensure that people had an easy onboarding to the projects. Um, and also, you know, as a way of, rather than us repeating the answers to the same questions over and over again to kind of provide a central uh, place for people to get answers to questions. So that was the pre-work. Um, and then during the um, actual cohort itself, again, this is one of the courses that we've done. Um, essentially, we had this timeline where we had kickoffs, a kickoff which was just more orientation to the project, letting people meet each other, um, deep dives about the projects. We also had some recommended courses for people to take, and I'll talk a little bit about those because those are also resources that you can utilize. They're free and open for anyone to utilize. Um, and you know, talking about how they can deploy the solution. And then we had like a cadence of events, where I think it's very important to have a cadence of things that will regularly occur during the course of um, the cohort. So we had office hours every two weeks, and then we had playback sessions on the alternating weeks. So office hours were on, I think on WebEx or Zoom, and maybe also on Slack where people can come and just ask questions, and we definitely had a lot. Surprisingly, I think uh, Morgan Stanley, just shout out to uh, Morgan Stanley, they're very engaged, so we definitely had lots of people coming to our office hours throughout the entire course of the cohort asking questions consistently. 
And then we also had playbacks. Um, for ours, we kind of kept it a little loose as far as the structure, just kind of gave them you know, um, the time slot and just roughly what they should cover. Um, going forward, we might do maybe a bit more structure there, but we still got some pretty good feedback or uh, were able to capture what they were working on during the projects pretty well as well. And then we also had, because the nature of our projects, there's a lot of, you know, we're trying to design and upload or advance the, um, some features as well. So we had some designing, design thinking around this, as well as some planning sessions to really try to figure out exactly what we should be working on. Um, and we kept this going, and then we had a final playback and retro for everyone. And then part of uh, ours, we also invited some key stakeholders, which I think is important to be able to get more people, um, you know, to be able to repeat the, the project, essentially, or repeat the cohort going forward. So we had more people who uh, took part um, in the final playbacks, uh, just so they can see the value of their employees being a part of this um, event as well. And then a little bit more about our resources. As I mentioned, we created these handbooks, um, which sat in GitHub where they could very, there were interactive handbooks where they could learn about the program, our contribution, contribution guidelines about the handbook, about the projects that they were doing, you know, the various steps to get involved. Of course, we had to reiterate things both in the handbook and also when we had our playbacks and our office hours, but it was good to, for them to have a resource to refer to, um, as well as knowing how to onboard to Slack, register for IBM Cloud, and just even logging their uh, volunteer hours through Morgan Stanley in uh, this example. Um, we also had some, as I mentioned, deep dive videos. So uh, we created some videos that walk through the actual issues and the repositories to provide more detail. Again, just trying to automate certain things so that um, we can just have a more centralized way and kind of reuse some of these materials going forward. So it's not always starting from zero when you're starting a new co uh, cohort as well. Um, as I mentioned, we had some playback and demo days. So this is actually from Hacktoberfest where we, um, you know, just to encourage people to see what progress is being made, to see what your, your fellow teammates or your fellow employees are doing, your fellow cohort members are doing. Um, it's really good and also a good way for people to be able to showcase and show off the work that they've done together. So we had uh, playbacks and demo days, as I mentioned, as part of this. And then a little bit more about the resources. So this was good because it helped people to better on board, right? So uh, for us within IBM, we have IBM, uh, this course, Introduction to Open Source. So if anyone's new to open source, they can participate. They can take this four hour course um, that allows them to learn about open source. They get some exposure to Git as well. At the end, they receive some certificates or a certificate. Um, we also have a design thinking course. So we encourage people who wanted to take part in, in our uh, cohort to take advantage of these resources. And again, you, you can also take advantage of these resources and include it as part of your core just by going to these websites here. All right, so a little bit about the results of what we found, you know, putting all this effort in. Um, just a bit more about casual contributions. Um, a few papers and publications have found that like, with casual contributions, people were just, you know, coming to your um, open source project and contributing. Lots of times they're providing Updates on typos and grammar, bugs, you know, sometimes new features, sometimes some code refactoring, right? So we definitely want to see whether or not this is something that's going to be val valuable to the maintainers, right? Whether or not these kind of contributions are um, useful for the maintainers in terms of the work that they put in. So this is why I think skill assessment is very important. So um, as I mentioned before, before starting the the entire cohort, it's kind of good to know what people's skills are so you can be able to better gauge the kind of contributions you expect to see and also the type of issues that you should uh, be highlighting for them to work on, whether that's bugs or just more documentation or some new features also. So for our Hacktoberfest cohort, essentially, uh, we saw, again, kind of similar to that paper that I just uh, put on the screen that we had similar distribution as far as the type of things. So we had some documentation, people fixing grammar errors, but also like finding things that just didn't work or links that were broken in our documentation and working on that. We also had people doing some um, improving our, just our CICD, um, GitHub actions, just making things more automated. And depending on the maturity of your project, you'll probably skew m what, uh, more to one side or another as far as um, where your contributions uh, the type of contributions you're getting from your cohort as well. For younger projects, you're probably going to see more documentation, 
um, as well as some just you know basic CI CD or GitHub actions, things that are implemented there. But for us, we also had saw a good uh, bit of UI updates or UI suggestions for things to be done with our projects. And then now for our enterprise engagement, um, so we had, um, with our cohort specifically, we had a few different types of contributions that were had. Um, we didn't really focus on documentation per se as like issues to work on, but we did say that if people found issues with the documentation, they should feel free to open a new issue, um, update the documentation, uh, make a pull request, and work on it. So the things that we found were, um, you know, UI updates, which is uh, the, in the top right, the community legislation at your fingertips. People, there were also some bug fixes that happened. Closer to documentation, uh, in the bottom left, we have uh, we had an opportunity for people to create a sandbox environment, so a lab that people can utilize to learn more about the project. Right, so basically being able to install the project but in a sandbox environment where nothing's going to break, right? Um, your dependencies are not out of date, like everything's going to work, you just have to follow the directions. So this is a good way we found for people to onboard to the project, so we wanted to improve our documentation by adding this to the projects as well. We also had some data model fixes, which is the uh, bottom middle picture there, where um, we had people actually providing great feedback um, as to how we might want to update our data model um, and add more data uh, to our models to be able to better document that information. And then the bottom right is some of the CI CD work that was done as part of our projects as well. So um, now we'll talk a little bit about the tips and trade-offs of uh, adopting a cohort model. So first of all, it's potentially very demanding for maintainers, right? It definitely requires a lot of upfront investment, but the benefit is that it can be repeatable over cycles. So we have to figure out like what parts of your um, projects or the contributions you're looking for are things that maybe you can just invest the time in to create um, evergreen documentation or onboarding or videos, et cetera, that can then be utilized by different cohorts coming through um, to work on over time. So, you know, another thing to think about is how can you actually make the effort worth it? So, one to is, that's needed to be done is to determine whether or not this model works well for your team makeup. So for us, like, we had some, I guess, uh, informal project managers such as myself who could work on this. So whether or not you have people on the team who are able to kind of plan things, organize things, and, you know, not be frustrated with that. Also, whether you have maintainers available to help, whether that's, you know, being a part of office hours, playbacks, helping you with choosing issues, um, and things of that nature. So really determining whether or not this model works for your team is gonna be the major first step to determining whether or not you should uh, look into a cohort model. The other thing is I think that's very important is to create a healthy pipeline of cohorts, right? So, you know, it's not, it wouldn't be great to just have one cohort and you never do this again because that's a lot of investment in the project or in this model. I think it's good to also have a group of people who might participate, um, who found interest uh, within, with working uh, on, on cohorts as well. So finding mission aligned groups as well as skill aligned groups. So finding uh, groups that have the skills that will be necessary to be able for them to onboard, of course, with some help, but not something where it's going to be a lot of time spent even with all the resources for them to get engaged effectively. And then just a little bit more on some tips, lots of tips here. Um, so as I mentioned before, and kind of this is like a summary, we have pre-work before launch. You want to provide training and onboarding. As I mentioned before, you want to know what your cohort skills are beforehand, potentially. Um, I mean, maybe it depends on you know, the audience that you're looking at. You might just be able to gauge what that is. Um, knowing what your cohort's time commitment is is also pretty critical and being able to choose an ideal time length. Um, actually, what we found in our cohort is that um, the, our most recent cohort is that people wanted to do this for longer, actually. So it was for eight weeks, and the feedback that we got repeatedly was like they would actually would have liked it if it maybe even went on for 12 weeks, which is very surprising for us, or to us, rather. Um, but I think it was because, they, again, they were very dedicated to the mission, and they just wanted to have enough time to work on it. And also, you know, because of the length of the projects and just in general, uh, it's really good to plan for team building activities and culture. So again, with the playbacks, if you have like a Slack channel, um, what we did was something called Thankful 
Thursdays where people can, you know, uh, recognize people who've helped them with their projects during the, the course of the week. Um, having happy hours or anything like that or games nights or games times for people to participate in. It's just very good to create like this kind of otherworldly experience within uh, the corporate environment where they're able to, you know, get a lot of low stress, hopefully, um, experience with their em uh, fellow employees uh, building something. So something, just, again, that just garners goodwill amongst the participants. Um, the other thing that we found that's very helpful is to encourage pair programming. So we found a lot of people made a lot more advances where they were able to schedule ad hoc times to talk to other people. Um, getting, uh, creating surveys to get feedback, such as what we did. Of course, getting buy-in from maintainers. Um, you need that upfront, otherwise this will not work at all. Um, but getting that buy-in and explaining to them the level of effort and knowing how that effort will reduce over time is something that's going to be critical. And also a drive to incentives. So this might be for pitching this to stakeholders. So what are the benefits to the organization or to their employees from this cohort? So things like certifications, as well as maybe any recognition um, on blog posts. So for instance, here, as an example, I'm using myself just because I, I don't want to you know, put anyone else's stuff out there. Um, you know, having the finishing or taking part of the open source course is something we get a certificate as part of that. And again, just a plug for the open source course, as well as uh, within IBM, we're able to also highlight people who took part in this initiative. Um, and just a little bit now changing uh, gears a little bit before we get into the Q&A, just wanted to highlight again just IBM's participation in OpenSSF. So we're working a lot on this issue of supply chain security. Um, and I encourage you to check out these materials to get a little bit more information there. Um, so we have a few minutes left, so I'm going to leave some time for my colleague Joanne to talk about uh, Call for Code, uh, our global challenge overall, and then after that I'll be able to take any questions that we might have from the audience. Oh, no, you can go first. Hello, thank you. Yes, so I am the ecosystem development leader for our Call for Code team. So thanks, Demi, for that. We just want to share a little bit about how to get involved. Um, there you go. So for this year, our 2022 uh, global challenge theme is sustainability and how technology can improve sustainable protection, production, consumption, management, uh, reduce uh, pollution, protect biodiversity. So those are some of the questions that are answered that you can answer as part of participating in the, um, the challenge for this year. And the challenge kicked off on April 26th of this year, and it runs through October 31st. We have gone through, uh, we got a slide with the actual timeline. So we have it broken up into accelerators. So we just finished the first accelerator, and we'll be kicking off the second one in a few weeks. And so there, these are some themes, some topics that you can actually work on that will be provided as part of the platform for working on some solutions. And it kind of varies. They all fall within the areas of sustainability. And we picked sustainability because, as you see, there are a number of companies, 86%, that actually have a sustainability uh, strategy, but only a few have acted on it. So we felt that that would be a great, um, great area to focus on. And then also global consumers, you know, the pandemic has affected them. So that's an area in which uh, we're looking for solutions more in the supply chain and, and those per specific areas. Oops. Okay, and this is the timeline, so this is the key thing, and all of this information is available on the platform, but we look, just like to show the timeline that I mentioned that was kicked off in April, and then we had the first accelerator in June, and then we have July 13th through the 27th is coming up. And the accelerator is just a two-week, uh, just, just prescriptive set of time that you can work on solutions. So we hope you get, uh, we get participation in those various areas. And it goes all the way through October 31st, and there are prizes that are available for participants. OK. 
Okay. And just some of the ways that organizations can uh, participate. So of course, participating in the challenge, but also we look for organizations who have APIs, they have technologies, they have some data sets that they can contribute to some of those solutions, such as Demi had mentioned earlier. We also look for mentors to participate. Um, and as she had already talked about, you know, it's a great way to engage employees and developers. Uh, within the company. I actually was one of the participants in the challenge within IBM a few years ago. And this, this is just a slide that we can make available. We're here to actually provide some input as or provide some feedback and more information. But we basically just say answer the call and then at the bottom there is a click through where you can register to get started on the platform on how to participate and start expanding your network and creating some solutions and building some solutions. So that's all I have. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so thank you, everyone. Um, happy to take any questions. Looks like we have about a minute. Anyone have any questions? All right, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs>